Everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today, Phil Helmuth tells his story. Phil is one of the biggest stars in the world of poker. But how do you become a star at gambling? Phil's been doing it for a long time, and he has made millions and millions of dollars. So how did he do it? Let's find out. Phil, how are you? I am fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're fantastic because I'm fantastic too and super excited to have you on the podcast because I was one of many uh, middle-aged white guys now, but young guys in the early 2000s who fell in love with watching the World Series of Poker on ESPN and you were one of the preeminent stars at that time. Uh, but your journey to poker began way before <laughs> before us, us like people who had no idea what was going on in the world of poker discovered it. But I'd love to go back to the time when the idea of being a professional gambler was a bit of an outlier. Like it was, it was quote unquote crazy. You did it <laughs> way before like people are doing it. It's like now if someone, if you ran someone say they're a professional gambler, they're like, cool. It's like, if you ran someone else, like I'm an influencer. Cool. Um, so when you decided to make that jump in the late eighties, yeah. early nineties, yeah. what was the reaction like to people in your hemisphere? Did they think you had just lost your board? Like what, tell me about those early interactions with either it was family or friends when you said, yep, yeah, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. My dad almost killed me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to be a professional poker player. Dad. <laughs> you were talking about like 1985 right now. Right. So at that point, at that point, and, and I lived in Madison, Wisconsin. At that point, it was like, what in the hell are you doing with your life? <laughs> You're going to be a professional gambler. No, I'm a professional poker player, a huge difference, but whatever. To him, I'm the oldest of five. He has a PhD, a JD, and an MBA, which is, I don't know anybody with that many letters, except my dad, but I'm sure there's a, a few out there. Yeah. And his father was a world famous heart surgeon, uh, when the heart surgeon, like in 1970s for the best heart surgeon in the world. And so what we had going on was education, education, education. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be you know, kind of uh, setting the course for my brothers and sisters. So all of that kind of piled onto each other. <laughs> Dad, I'm going to drop out of school to play poker. <laughs> I mean, he was so upset and we wouldn't talk to me for months. And, um, and I mean, there was a stigma against being a professional poker player back then. And unfortunately, you know, it was a kind of a strong stigma and, uh, you know, um, even when I met my wife, I, uh, back in 1989. Wow. Good thing you remember that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even when I met her, she was like, you know, she almost canceled the first date when she found out I was a professional poker player. Wow. It's, and do you find it like nutty that, you know, like I said, a lot of a lot of Americans discovered it in the 2000s. But at that point, what you'd been doing it for 15 years, and to see where you were, to a point where your father almost disowned you, and your future wife and dream girl say, "What, what am I going to do with this nut?" Uh, to where it became, and it is now. It's sort of obviously leveled out. It's no longer has like wall to wall coverage on ESPN, but you could still certainly see poker on television at any time of day. Uh, when you saw that rise, were you like? Holy shit, what is going on right now? I think we have a hundred thousand subscribers to Poker Go. Okay. And the Poker Go that's an app that has, you know, network quality uh, coverage of a lot of live events. So if you want to watch the World Series of Poker, if you want to watch it's coming up, you want to watch final tables of the World Series of Poker, and now other games are spreading. People like seven card stud, they like seven card stud high low, they like a game called Omaha. They like Omaha high low. They like uh, deuce to seven where you're drawing to try to low ball. And so if you want to watch those final tables, you never know who's going to be good at these games. People seem to have a knack for some games and play others horribly. I've known us my whole life. So if you want to watch all of those final tables, they start on Poker Go like May 29th. And so we'll probably have 150,000 subscribers for that month. Wow. And so, and then, you know, it's still on all kinds of networks, uh, poker all the time. And, um, so yeah, it's, uh, back in the day when you were watching, 
Yeah. We also had late night poker, which was on six days a week on NBC. Oh, that's right. That's but started right. at two in the morning and tons of people converted from that. So what you're seeing is this huge upsurgence in poker. Now we know this, the pandemic, what the hell were you going to do? Yeah. So all these guys, like all the million people that had quit playing poker, um, all went back to the poker and they discovered that they're much better at it. They're older, they're more mature and they play better and they have a better chance. And so they had this huge resurgence of people that left poker, which doesn't happen a lot. They all came back and then we had the youth and, uh, anecdotally <laughs> from the anecdotal evidence, but we know there's real evidence. It's just crazy how I'm in an airport and these people come up to me and they look like they're 15. I mean, I'm, I'm a lot older now. Yeah. And they're like, I'm your biggest fan. And I think to myself, you're not my fucking biggest fan. You look like you're 15. <laughs> but of course I engage and I'm like, hey, can we get a picture? I'm like, yeah, how old are you guys? 21, 19, okay. 20, 23, 20. It's just crazy. And I think there's a proliferation. I think I personally have been all over TikTok. Um, and I don't even have a TikTok account, but my, like the karate combat people are telling me, Phil, you're all over TikTok. It's unbelievable. And, um, and so I think, you know, there's this proliferation of poker that came back in from all these people that were stuck at home and this younger generation. So it seems like we really have right now the, you know, the 18 to the 23 year olds. And then wow. we don't have the 24 to the 33 year olds, but then we have everybody above that age. So it seems to be like one nine year period where they're not massive into the game. And then we have, uh, you know, power poker. Uh, poker power, which has started, and it's uh, and this woman named Jenny Just, who's maybe the best female entrepreneur of all time, and I'm friends with Cheryl Sandberg, and I think Cheryl's, you know, she's pretty good. But, uh, she, well, she, so Jenny Just made, so she decided like, she just decided that she never played poker in her life. She's like, I don't think women take enough risk, and so I'm going to teach my 16 year old daughter how to play poker. She never played before. They entered this journey together. And now, uh, uh, I want to get it right, Power Poker, I think it's called. Okay. They've taught 100,000 women in the United States how to play poker. Wow. Um, and the first time, you know, it's because Jenny thinks that women need to learn how to take more risk. Because guys learn how to take big risk early. Yeah. So it's just like watching poker just take off on every level is crazy. And, uh, and it's been really fun to watch the resurgence. We always knew there'd be a super boom. Uh, didn't think it would take this long, but we're in the middle of a super boom. Wow. That's so cool. That's awesome. And going back to those early days, um, for folks that, that watch you are probably watching the YouTube clips now of you. Um, you had this sort of image about you because you were playing up you, the celebrityness of you before you were a celebrity, you were known as the, one of the bad boys of poker. It was that intentional or was that just you being a dick like for lack of <laughs> was that just you just being yourself or were you like yeah i'm really going to but i always like to say you know when people are personalities and people are off off stage you know they turn their their dial up to 11 were you just turning your dial up to an 11 when you were playing poker i think that's me and so a, a lot of people but a lot of people know see the poker world's been incredible because even since 2009 since to, the players came up to me and they said, Phil, this is, I'm really sick of this. Everybody that I tell is a poker player, they all ask immediately about you. And <laughs> I heard this from all the top pros over and over for years. And it's still, they're still coming up to me and saying, Phil, what the hell? Every time I say I'm a pro, people say, is Phil, how many is a good guy or a bad guy? Wow. The poker world knows I'm a great person. I've never cheated on my wife. I'm very calm and cool and collected away from the table. But for whatever reason, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm known for honor and ethics. And I think the young players respect me because I'm a family man. But they don't respect the way I play poker. <laughs> but they respect me. And right. so, but that's good. So, you know, they, they, they don't understand really what I'm doing. That's another issue. So, yeah, it's, it turns out, you know, I always thought when I became the bad boy of poker, and 03, 04, 05, I thought by 07 or 08, people would realize that I'm just a really good person. Nope. <laughs> and I gave them, so you know, I put the cameras on me 24 hours a day, 24 seven. And when I lose it, that one hand for two minutes, that's what goes public. 
they don't show the two days where I was super calm and, and playing with everybody and everybody was kind of laughing and enjoying. And so, so then the world got the wrong impression. Phil is an asshole. What you said earlier, are you an asshole? Yeah. I didn't blink. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the reputation that I earned bad guy. And, uh, and but but not just for being able not being able to handle my losses being John McEnroe like yeah. at the table, and of course they realized by 07 and 08 that the all of the you know people behind all the producers were like Phil please be yourself, yeah. you know I'm like what do you mean? This is good TV. Please be the That's poker brat. Please be the TV. poker brat. Yeah. The yeah. poker brat gets great ratings. Great ratings are, is great for poker, and great ratings get you out there on the network. And so, but I don't know if I ever acted my entire life. Um, so maybe once or twice, I put a little extra on the uh, little mustard. But that's on just it. yeah. People don't understand. You know, you, you play. By the time they see a final table, I've already played two ten-hour days of perfect poker to get there. Wow. Now we're eight hours into day three, and we're now we're at the final four or five or whatever. And then somebody does something which is just horrendous poker. Maybe I've been watching this guy play horrendous poker for hours and saying, how is it possible he's still here? But there's luck in our game. And then all of a sudden he does something to me that he's not supposed to do. And I just see the, and then I feel like it's unjust. It's unfair. No, in the moment I feel unjust, unfair. Listen, I'm blessed with perfect health. I'm very wealthy. I'm famous. I have the respect of my peers. And so I, you know, and you know, I have healthy family, two wonderful sons, a fantastic wife and a great family. And so I have all this, like all these blessings stacked up and then this, but I lose it in this moment. I'm like, this is unfair. This is unfair. And when I leave the table, I'm like, wait a minute. So you have all these blessings, shut the fuck up. And plus maybe you got lucky once or twice to get here. But in that moment, that rage is about, I'm playing better than anybody else in the world. I'm the best in the world. I deserve to win. I don't deserve to get unlucky. And, you know, it's kind of absurd a little bit. Um, but I mean, and then sometimes people are like, why, why is he upset? They don't understand that the same guy beat me for four or five hours straight. All they show is that clip. Yeah. So yeah, there's a plethora of reasons why I lose it and they're all justified. No, they're not. I definitely crossed the line, but, um, but I think that, um, don't judge me by my worst moments or I'll go to your workplace or your home and I'll judge you when you're in your worst moments, you know? And I'm sure there's probably like a super cut of Phil Hellmuth, uh, you know, meltdowns. And, and I'm sure to you at this point in your life, you know, as we get older, Phil, everything kind of like just blends together and, and we kind of get dates wrong and what was going on. Is there one meltdown that still kind of haunts you? Like, Ugh, I wish I didn't do that. Is, is there one of those that just stick in your car that every once in a while it just pops in your brain? Like, oh, like we all do. Like, man, I wish I didn't say that one thing to that one person. But like, do, do you do you have that moment in, in like your everyday life now where a, a meltdown pops back into your brain? No, um, but I do have, but I can relate to the other two aspects of what you just said. So I don't have the meltdowns don't pop into my head. They pop in maybe for a day or two. But they don't pop in a week later, a month later. What does pop in a week, a month, and even years later is how maybe I misplayed a hand and cost myself a world championship or like tournament. Like actual hands? Like mm -hmm. the actual hand? And mm -hmm. how specific do you get? Do mm -hmm. you get to like where you have actually memorized everyone's hand? In, in no. Play? No, I mean, like you said, things start to blend a little bit. You know, now I'm, I'm 59 which people don't believe, which is great. No one, no one who sees me in person believes it because I have a lot of energy. I walk around. But yeah, so at some point, you can't remember. I had almost a photographic memory for a long time. But yeah, you're talking about things that pop into your head when you're in the shower. or yeah. And those aren't regret for meltdowns. Those are regret for hands that I misplayed, specific hands oftentimes. That hasn't happened as often to me much uh, lately. Um, but I mean, man, it would be like not 2001 and I'd, oh my God, I can't believe I messed that hand up in 1996. <laughs> it would just pop into my head randomly. And then the other aspect of what you said is interesting. You said, Hey, I wish sometimes, sometimes as human beings, we interact with other human beings and we say, damn it. I wish I went to said that. Yeah. And what happens with me is <clears throat> I'm not perfectly secure. 
never have been, maybe never will be. Um, even as I've created tremendous friends that, that I love and respect. And then, so my thing is, you know, I'll, I'll be like, oh, am I talking too much? Hmm. And this has haunted me for hmm. 20 years, 25 years. If my ego is too big, then I talk too much, brag too much. So then, you know, but, but hmm. I'm out hmm. of the spotlight hmm. most of my life, right? I mean, it's not like, it's not like any actor hmm. is always in the spotlight. You're acting and then you get all the press. So there's a normal life you have to navigate. Hmm. And so hmm. for the last four or five years, I'm like, am I talking too much? Should I talk too much on interaction? And I finally gave myself a break a few months ago. I said, you know what? You're just a live wire. That's what you are. Yeah. And, you know, and I called my best friend up. Shamath Paliapati is my best friend. And I called him up and I'm like, dude, I had a realization. I've been beating myself up way too much about talking too much. And I just decided I'm a live wire. And, and then he was really nice and kind. Could have taken, could have made fun of me and said, you know, he said, you add a lot of positivity and energy to all of our lives, ah. which was a really sweet way of saying, hey, you're a live wire. That's what you are. And, and there's a lot of benefit to it. And so that's kind of the same thing. So that's kind of the way I'm like, you know, I just am who I am. And so I'm starting to get a certain, a little bit more comfortable. But man, I, I would beat myself up too much. I'd be on a trip and ask my son, did I talk too much? No, you were okay. Oh. And, you know, so, I mean, I, we all have that human to human in our interactions. I wish I went to said that was your example, or <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have done that or, you yeah. know. Yeah, no, that's great. And you, you mentioned actors. I, and I know during the time that I fell in love with, with watching you guys play uh, you know, the World Series of Poker and, and following you in all those different poker events, that actors and celebrities really, really got into poker. And... It seemed like some of them were better than others, just like anything. Are there any that you came across that you're like, eh, if this person honed their skills or, you know, put in his, you know, put in my Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours, they could be good. Were there any that could be, if, if they really tried, become professional poker players? Toby Maguire uh, is the best Hollywood poker player. He, he could be a professional and make a lot. Of, in fact, he's made a lot of money. Yeah. So he's a professional level player who's been playing with a lot of super rich amateurs and he's made an un, a, a huge amount of money. Um, I don't want to rat out how much money he's made, but he's one of the biggest winners. Fantastic player. You go to the athlete side. Uh, Draymond Green, I think, is the best athlete poker player in the world right now. Um, I've given him, you know, 100 lessons. Uh, oh. You know, Draymond plays in our regular game, which he doesn't mind me saying. And uh, our regular high stakes game area and, and game in the Bay Area and L.A. And he's just a fantastic poker player, but played with me a lot in the pandemic. And like he is just fantastic and just he's so smart. He's so sharp. He picks up everything. I mean, here's a guy that was like 25 years old, was at our table. The youngest guy there was like 40. Wow. And somehow he fit right in. When you say high stakes, Phil, give us some context. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, winner lose fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, you know, uh, two hundred thousand on a, a really good or really bad day. Um, but mostly, mostly the regular game, we swing fifties, fifty thousand. And why do you think, besides your coaching, uh, Draymond uh, excelled in it? Because I'm just, I'm wondering, like you mentioned, Tommy McGuire and, and Draymond, like I mean, what look, makes look at, look at Draymond, look. But look at Draymond. He said he said the leader of the team from from the time he was like twenty two or twenty three. He, so that means he understands how to manage people. He knows where they're supposed to be, how to move parts. You ask all of his teammates. They all love him. He knows you have to be here, you have to be here, you have to be here, and he'll be aggressive about it. He'll scream and yell uh, at the players, be in this position, be in that position. Um, at the end of the day, they can choose to be offended by that, but most times they're like, ah, he's right, he's right, he's right. They want to be better. And so Draymond is managing people. That's what we do at the poker table. He's managing assets. And he sees the strategy for basketball. Great. So, you know, just a, a fantastic human being. We all love him. And, um, yeah, he's just, this guy's going to just, he's just, he's going to be a billionaire for sure. And he's going to get there in five different ways. And he can also commentate. I mean, a pretty, pretty impressive guy. Wow. And so I wonder if there's a little kinship between you and Draymond, because he 
course. The lack of, for, it's like it's basically like the bad boy of basketball. Uh, has that ever come out when he plays poker? Because we we see it in basketball regularly, even even in practice. Um, but does that does that side of Draymond ever come out when when you're playing poker? Perfectly calm at the table, just like I'd be perfectly calm usually when I play basketball. I once had I once uh, I once had a little internet contest where I paid the winner like five hundred dollars to do the best Draymond Phil compilation. It's really <laughs> funny, really funny, because it shows me just losing it and you know, you know, saying I'm going to burn the place down and <laughs> fucking swearing and stuff, and it shows him doing the same thing. So you know he's he's getting teed up, and I'm getting like, and so that compilation, which some of them are a minute, two minutes long, where we go. Where he loses it, I lose it. Pretty funny. And then I host the Warriors Charity Poker Tournament. We've raised um, three million this year. So I have the microphone, three million bucks. Wow. Um, it's incredible. And so one year I had him play the video compilation. They thought I was being really cocky until they saw the compilation. Everybody was laughing at us. Uh, um, yeah. So I, I feel a kinship with Draymond for sure. And uh, and uh, he's just gonna. I mean. I told him he's going to make $10 million playing poker. I have no doubt that's going to be the case. That's impressive. Yeah, you know, that's the one thing I love about humans, too. It's like, if you had asked me, Joe, name 100 basketball players that you think are good poker players, I don't know if Draymond would be in my top 50. Like, I just wouldn't even think that. But you 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 laid out it perfectly why why he's so good at it. And then, obviously, it's over, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, the Malcolm Gladwell thing, the 10,000 hours. Obviously, he's also putting in the time as well. Yeah, I think he's close to the 10,000 hours. I do think the Malcolm Gladwell thing has an effect. I use that with Jennifer Tilly, mm. who I just love filming with. She's always one of my first choices to invite to film. She's just super nice. She's super smart. It's kind of fun. She tries to kind of hide behind not being smart at the table, but she's right. brilliant. And you can see it if you're paying attention. Oh, yeah, she's super smart. And so she's just a pleasure to be with. Great charisma, funny and, you know, and she's, she's suddenly like, you know, she's been winning. All, she's done really well at poker now for a long time. Wow. And uh, she's fantastic. You know, uh, in the NBA, you know, Russell Westbrook is a fantastic poker player as well. You, you know, uh, you look at, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the world's biggest celebrities, Kevin Hart is one hell of a poker player. You know, a, a lot of these people are just fantastic at poker. And, you know, world-class players and, you know, and, and we see that and there's a lot of billionaires that play, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's crazy. And I, you know, focusing back on your career in, in terms of your love of poker, I wonder because you've done it for so long and it's one of these, one of these sports that you, you if you want to be good at it, you got to play it all the time. Do you ever get to the point, Phil, where, and I'm sure this happens in everyone's career, but like. God, I just I need a break from this goddamn poker. Like I, I just need to uh, unwind, disconnect. Does that ever happen to you where you just need to take a mental break from from any kind of poker whatsoever, whether it's you playing with your friends or going out of the casino or being involved with tournaments? No, but I'll tell you, I don't live in Vegas right now. I'm in Northern California. I'm in Palo Alto. Right, my doc, my wife is a doctor up here, and I love my wife. We've been together since 1989. I'm super happy. She and I fit really well together. We put in a lot of work and our, a lot of work. And, um, you know, we sp spent a lot of time in therapy, which improves me and improves my poker, improves her. And we just get smarter and smarter. And our EQ keeps going up, which is really helpful for me at the poker table. And so because of that, because family is number one, um, I... I don't get to play often enough. You know, I get to play once a week in my regular high stakes game up here. Wow. And, uh, you know, and then there were times in the past where I wouldn't play for a month, two months at a time. And so I just, I can't wait for the world series of poker. It's right around the corner. Phil, what do you like when the, when those month offs, when you're just kind of off, hands off, you know, what, what do you, are you a different person? Or are you just so chill that you're like, Hey, you're like probably a, a regular soccer dad. During those like months, months when you're just not totally invested in poker, I could never be that chill. But yeah, I did coach <laughs> my, I did coach my son's soccer teams and uh, basketball teams, and uh, and spent a lot of time doing that. Um, it doesn't mean that I was a calm coach. <laughs> it doesn't mean. <laughs> I hope not. That would be so off brand for you, Phil. 
and now my my sons are 33 and 30. So for me, you know, what I've been doing is I've advised, I think I've signed 26, about to sign my 27th advisor agreement. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just realized that I'm going to become a billionaire. I thought maybe in 15 years, but it could be sooner. I'm just not trying to billionaires, trying to become a billionaire is not my goal, but I love, but, but I, these advisor deals, some are taking off prize picks is an incredible company. We had as many downloads as DraftKings and FanDuel in the wow. last five months. We had more downloads, prize picks than DraftKings and FanDuel. All the kids know about prize picks. It's just, you know, you bet over unders. And so, you know, I started advising the founder, um, in, uh, in 2020, I invested money. And so, you know, I have, you know, karate combat I'm involved in. We had 10 million people watch one of our fights. And so it's been really fun for me to come on board as an advisor. And then oftentimes I change the entire, I, I just have to basically, if they're giving me 2% of the company and, you know, maybe one of these companies is now worth 10 billion. And if I have 1%, that's a hundred million dollars for me. And so I have several companies that are, you know, that are really baked well. And then I'm also doing SPACs, which a lot of people out there listening to your podcast don't even know what that is. Um, but I've done uh, four SPACs and, and now I'm a partner in the fifth SPAC. That's where you raise uh, 10 million bucks. You go to the market and you launch your SPAC. You raise, we raised a hundred million. And then, and then you go and you look for companies. And so the business stuff is what keeps me occupied when I don't have a lot, you know. And so, you know, arguably I'm ramped up a little too high. I like running 80 miles an hour. It feels like lately I've been going 90. Yeah. But yeah, I've changed the, I've helped these founders change the course of, I mean, of their companies a bunch of times. Sometimes I've, I've helped them pivot 50% in one deal. Wow. But all I really have to do is show up and help them change their company 2%. What does that mean? Well, how can I do all these? I only do 10 hours a year. It's in my contract. I'll help you 10 hours a year. But it's like a sheet of paper. I'll introduce you to these 10 people, and then I try to introduce to 30. I'll help you when you go raise money from VCs, and I'll help you. So raising money, introducing to my network, raising non-VC money is really important to the founders because <laughs> VCs, the checks are too small. And so for me, that's been really fun. And and then, you know, 18 of my deals, I've already earned my points and I'm just kind of sitting back. I'll still take the founder's phone calls, but they're not going to call me as often. And, uh, you know, I joined Nutcase Milk uh, as an advisor. What's Nutcase Milk? What is that? It's a new cashew milk. And my first move as an advisor is that I want to hire Ninja to come to the brand. You know who Ninja is? Oh, uh, the, the gamer guy? He's the... Yeah, with the, the blue hair. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Great guy, he and I. And so what happens? Fast forward to four months later, we've hired Ninja. And I just shot with him last Tuesday, and we just launched Nutcase Milk May 1st. So that's my idea, getting into the real world. We're going to hire Ninja as our guy. Boom, it happens, and then I feel really good. Wow, how much did I influence Nutcase Milk? A lot. The founder's fantastic, Joel, and uh, it's a very healthy milk product. And so... If that brand goes to three hundred million dollars, and I got two points as an advisor, that's six million. I also invested a little bit, and so that's what I can do from an advisor side is just help scheme and come up with deals. So that's fun for me. And uh, and then during the World Series, I've written every contract. The founders are not allowed to call me. So <laughs> May twenty fifth through July seventeenth, I'll just focus on how to play these. 10 different poker games that we're going to play every day and give away world championships in. That's awesome. That's great. A uh, couple of last things. Uh, one, your dad, you mentioned he, he, he was not happy with your decision. Uh, did he get to see the fruits of your labor? Did he see that? Hey, I guess this numbskull uh, was right. Uh, did, did, did you have that conversation with him? Oh yeah. No, I mean, uh, and I talked to my dad once a week still, but he, uh, he, in 1989, he decided to support me after a couple of years of a little more friction between us. And he flew out to the main event. He said, you're going to win it this year. And I said, yes, I'm going to win it this year. Just had, I don't know, a vision that I was going to win it. And he flies out and he gets to see me win the main event, which 
Wow. 750,000. I guess they tell me that's like 10 million today. Yeah. Or I don't know, 8 million, whatever. And so, you know, he was there and, you know, and then it was such an incredible moment, me putting my hands up like this and you can go on the internet and you can see me the last hand. I go like this and I turn around and my dad's running up to give me a hug. There's this pile of money there. And I played Johnny Chan heads up in the last hand. And it's like, you know, uh, we're talking about TV shows and movies capturing that moment. And which, which is going to, which we think where he's going to get greenlit soon. But my dad being there and giving me a hug and then, you know, and then, and I married my wife. So, all right. Uh, you know, all right. I bought him a new Mercedes. Okay. Stop bothering me. I married my wife. Who's a doctor. That's enough education. Stop bothering me. In like 2000, I was asked to speak at, um, at, uh, what's the big university in, uh, Oxford. Oh, in England. And yeah. Churchill spoke. And I said, called my dad and I said, all right, dad, <clears throat> now, you know, you never thought this could come from a non, non-academic, but I'm going to go speak at Oxford. Wow. And my wife is like, you have to do it. You have to do it. And so we packed up the kids and flew to London for that. And so, you know, it feels like um, he's pretty happy. Check, 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 check. The new Mercedes never bothered me again about poker. I, I bet he didn't. That, that's such an awesome story. I got chills you sharing with it. I'm sure you, you, just you yourself, you're probably like to relive it. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and I, lastly, I, you can tell I, I'm, I have a big smile on my face as yeah. I tell that one. Uh, it's so good. Um, one more thing, and then I'll let you go, is I always rem- I still remember, like, I'm, I'm a terrible poker player. I play, and you'll laugh, I play limit poker when I'm an AC or something like that. Uh, but I'll remember, like, losing a lot of money in one hand. Uh, what is the most money you've extracted from another person in one hand? Do, do, and I'm sure you, it's kind of silly that I'm pretty sure you know, but is there one amount that you got, you got like, I don't know, a million dollars you got from one hand from one person in one of these high stake games? Was there something like that? I can tell you my biggest loss. Uh, I was okay. playing in Monte Carlo. We were staying at the Hotel de Paris, which is supposed to be one of the world's best hotels. I do remember you would order, uh, you know, Dover Soul. And it was, <clears throat> I ordered every day because it was so good. It was like 120 euros. This is when oh. the euro was 50 up. So we're talking about maybe 07, 08, 09. And there I was and Phil Ivey and I played and he beat me for $536,000. And, uh, and that was just, that one was just, I called my wife and I'm like, honey, I called her and I said, you're not getting off the phone until we spend a million today. And I said, I want it to go to charity. And so we had to fill about 464,000 said, if I'm fucking stupid enough to lose 536. And so I'm not getting off the phone. 35 minutes. I was on the phone with her and she wrote $460,000 worth of checks to charity Oh, she paid down the mortgage, 200000 wrote 236000 to charity. I wouldn't get off the phone until those were sent. And it took wow. her 35 minutes. And I said, well, if you're going to remember this day, that's, let's have some positive in there too. Help pay down the mortgage, gave a bunch of money. I know, I know that we gave some money to doctors without borders. And, um, and so that was a significant day, uh, you know, where that was rough. Now that 500k was that over the course of a day or was that one hand? About a day, about a day. Uh, we were playing high stakes in uh, in my suite, then in his suite, and uh, rough day. Oof, man, that is I I you just the idea of losing five hundred thousand dollars playing poker makes my sphincter tighten really hard. Uh, so that's the, I can't even imagine someone like you who's used to winning, and I'm sure you're used to losing as well, but not to that extent. Uh, it's crazy. What a life you've lived, Phil. Uh, I really appreciate the time you spent with me today. Uh, I am not going to be able to send you $50,000 for this conversation, <laughs> uh, but I will give you my love. I will say thank you. Thank you, sir. Phil. Wait, wait, I, I charge you. you my, I charge you my daily press rate. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So, oh, geez. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> A zero. <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. Phil, thanks again for the time. Really appreciate it. All right, Joe. Have a good one. And that's today's good listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note, you can email me at JoePartavilla at ProtonMail.com. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please give us a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, please give us a big old thumbs up. 
Thanks for spending some time with me today. Until next time, adios.